and it was a guitarist then quite unknown. It was West Montgomery. first of all, but also as, um, yeah, I guess things that students are, students are driving, offering students uni one teach, is um, something I wish existed back when I was here. I always did like my entrepreneurial stuff, which you can ask questions about later if you really want to. Um, but it was all up here in that, so that you guys get these chances to collaborate now is really awesome. Um, what, like, the structure of today is going to be is just really, really quick intro to the kind of startup concept. Um, give you this tool called the Lean Canvas. Has anyone heard of or used it before? No? Easy, yeah. Top of the class, superstar. Um, yeah, like really, really simple uh, way to sort of frame what your business might look like. Uh, so we're gonna do one hypothetical, hopefully semi-fun example of just making up business on the spot. And then from there, we'll do some quick work. Uh, we, you know, putting the Lean Canvas into practice for an actual business idea of your own. Who here has ideas they're currently working on or in the business they're playing with? A handful of hands, cool. So we might gravitate around those people and form some little teams around them for the purposes of the exercise. Um, and then I'm gonna get you guys to all pitch back kind of where you got to the um, benefit of your canvas. Starting with the definition of what a startup is, we all see it in you know all the articles online and that sort of stuff. It's becoming, I think, a fair bit of a buzzword. This is my favorite definition of a startup. Um, just because I think it really is clear about we don't actually know where we're going to end up when you're trying to build something completely new. If, I mean, if you're trying to build a shop, you know, corner store, or deli, that kind of model has been proven out and exists. You just need to find a corner and fill it with stuff and sell it. A startup is about creating something that's entirely new. And again, the stuff I really like here is this chap, Dave McClure, who comes up with this definition, is so upfront about that uncertainty that's in there. Yeah, you don't know what your product is, who your customers are, how you're going to make money. So all of you imagine going to the bank to get a loan and telling them that that's your kind of business model, you're not going to get very far. But the reality is in startup life, it is actually you know, the approach we're taking. Uh, the tool that we recommend uh, to start at weekends that I help run and then also with my day work for Colonizer um, is a Lean Canvas. Why the Lean Canvas is really cool is it just gets you to dump all of your assumptions on a page and just gets you started uh, you know, with a really simple version of a business that can move over time. Again, the reality is this is a super uncertain journey. You're doing something that doesn't exist. You're starting with a whole bunch of assumptions. Uh, when I did my first startup out of uni, I thought I knew exactly what I was going to build. And I did a 30-page business plan and it was really glossy with lots of photos and stick graphs and financial project projections and, um, you know, ABS data research, etc., etc. But the reality was as soon as I kind of had hit save on that file, that everything had moved again because I got a different email from a customer or something else had changed. So instead we say rather than building that big 30-page glossy doc, let's come up with a format that can change and evolve with you as you sort of understand more about your business. Uh, so again, why do we not recommend you kind of what the bank might think of as your traditional business plan? A, a war quote here, and I'll give you a preferred quote straight after this, but the reality is no campaign plan survives first contact with the enemy. So again, we're not saying planning, it's just something you throw out you know, in the trash. Uh, what we're saying is you need to be much more nimble and in this sort of discovery mode, really trying to find a sustainable business model, not just assuming you have one from the 
very beginning. Um, the other little point to note here, if I can use my little pointer button, we're not saying that your customer is the enemy, like they're the most important person in your business, but the reality is as soon as you get out of the building and start talking to your customers, you'll start learning new things about exactly what it is you're trying to build and you'll end up, you know, potentially going in some different directions. So this is my much preferred, you know, definition of why we absolutely plan and prepare before a business or a fight, but everything goes out the window as soon as we actually get there into action. Balloon Canvas framework, it's really, really simple. We're gonna step through these um, in a practical example in a sec. It's a collection of nine different cells. So I'm gonna step you guys through one by one what each, uh, what each of these little rectangles stands for. Broadly, if you were to cut the whole nine cells up, on one side, we're sort of worrying about the product, what it is that we're gonna build. And on the other side, we're looking, you can't take notes, it's not a uni lecture. Um, the other side, we're thinking about the market. So who are we gonna actually sell this uh, product to? Um, if I quickly like step back, who reads all the boring, crappy startup blogs and that sort of stuff? No shame, that's cool. Um, has anyone heard of a phrase, problem solution fit? There's sort of this school of thought that in building a business, there's a bunch of stages to it. Um, for many of us, and it was my biggest, one of my biggest failings when I did my first startup, was we jump straight to the third stage, which is scaling the business, because we get excited. We just think that's how we make more money. We just pour more marketing dollars in the top and more cash flows out the bottom. Um, instead, what we're saying is there's three, three stages to this sort of discovery process as you get to understand more about your business. The first of those is called problem solution fit, so we can solve a known problem for ultimately a customer who's willing to pay us money. The second stage is called product market fit. So that's like, hey, we've built this thing that kind of has its job, now we're gonna turn it into a business. So again, if you come back to product and market, what we're saying to you is when you can start a, start bringing all of these cells together and you know have them talking to each other, you're on the way to product market fit. Once you get to that point, you can then start thinking about scaling and hopefully get super rich. The nine cells, most of which should sort of speak for themselves, but it all at the end of the day starts with cells one and two. They do jump around a bit, so keep that in mind. But the first cell um, is problem, it should speak for itself. At the end of the day, I'd encourage you to whether it be yourself or if you've got a friend talking about their idea, straight away just like bash them and say, okay, stop using the word idea, what's the problem you're solving? All of a sudden when you start reframing it like that, it changes, it's a really subtle change, but it changes how you think about what it is you're building. Um, yeah, like I said, problem should speak for itself. The next one is customer. Again, straight away when that person says, I've got this idea, go back and hit them and say, what's the problem you're solving? Who are you solving it for? As soon as you look at it through that lens, everything changes. Um, I will quickly caution and say, whilst you know, ideally we fill these out in sequence. You don't always have to start with problem and then come to customer. For some people, it'll be the other way around. You'll start with customer because you might know that you know group really well. For example, if your customer was some CAT students, because you feel like you just know exactly the challenges these people are facing, you might start by framing the some CAT students and then go to the other side and think about what problems they've got that you can help with. The third cell, you know, is bringing those two sides of this canvas together, bringing the product and the market side together. Unique value proposition. Does anyone want to hazard a guess as to what that means? Or what are you doing different? Yeah, it's yeah. much. Yep, yep, great. Super concise descriptions of it. But a lot of people will normally say, oh, is that the same as unique selling proposition? Yes, but I much prefer the more um, casual way you guys have framed that. So it is, to be honest, when you can fill out this in a sec, it's the part of the canvas that most people struggle with more than any other for probably 80% of people. This is the one they sort of scratch their head. Um, my recommendation to you if you're struggling to come up with a unique value proposition is think about who's already in this space, who your competitors are, because you will have competitors, and then, so what do they do? And then reframe it, so what are you differently to them? How are you gonna be so unique and compelling and awesome that customers are gonna leave you know, company X, incumbent X, and come across to you in droves? So it's a really, it is very important to, to get that right. The fourth cell, again, I think a lot of people, and this is another of my failings, we start from solution and then we feel we try to match a problem and a customer to you know this product we want to build. Um, so instead what we're saying is start with problem and customer and some unique way of solving their problem. 
and then can you define your solution once you've got that, um, you know, like the bedrock in place. Uh, again, the things to keep in mind with solution is you don't need to sit there and give us this full glossy of, you know, every little bell and whistle that your solution is going to have. Keep it super sharp. Just start with like three, four bullet points of just basic key features you need. Again, if we're like mindful that this business is going to evolve a lot over time, um, there's no point building everything from the start. So we want to get to like the smallest, cheapest, easiest to deliver kernel of a solution and then we can sort of build and iterate from there. So what are the three or four key features that you think your, you know, your app or your website or whatever it is? What are the three or four key features you just absolutely need to have from day one? Channels, does anyone ever guess what that means? Anyone doing marketing here? The way to reach the customer? Yeah, spot on. So again, it's no coincidence that it sits right next to the customer cell in the lane canvas, because this is how we take the product to the customer. For most of us, when we start the business, we're going to be doing it via, you know, like one-on-one -on -one coffee catch-ups and that sort of stuff. Really unscalable way of selling things. Channels is how we take that next step towards a bit more of a scaled up kind of distribution approach. It might be partnerships with, you know, company XYZ or, you know, a network of people. Essentially, is there a place where your customers are already gathering that you can just take your product to them? They've already done the work of, you know, pulling all these people together. So can you piggyback off that and, um, and leverage it? Other channels are the more traditional ones like your, yeah, you know, like Google, SEO, Facebook ads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but just something to think about: channels. How are we going to take this thing to market? We get into the more business model type sales after this. Revenue speaks for itself. Rather than saying though, our revenue is going to be one hundred thousand dollars in year one, five hundred thousand dollars in year two, and three million bucks in year three. Um, instead for your revenue assumptions, just say more the type of revenue model you think will get you to those numbers. So if we're going to be a subscription service and we're going to be you know, selling that subscription at $9.95 a month or whatever it might be. Um, costs, again, should speak for itself. What are the most common costs you guys think you're going to face in businesses that you might want to start up? Throw them at me, anyone? Labor. Legal, staff, labor, yep. Um, web hosting or like web development, a lot of people will say if they don't have um, the technical skills already. Um, I put it to you, especially as, um, you know, students who are early on in your business path, I think your greatest cost at this time, or this stage is your time. So I think you should factor that in. Um, you know, at the end of the day, really you wanna just maximize your learning, get through speed of learning. Yeah, so then we get more efficiency out of that cost. But you guys have this awesome opportunity to play around with lots and lots of different ideas. So, you know, your biggest impediment other than the money side of it for most of it will be time. The other cost I'd encourage you to think about, especially as the businesses are evolving, is customer acquisition costs. So what that means is essentially how much does it cost me to put my product in front of one customer who then goes all the way through my sales funnel. Um, as much as we might think customers just come to us, there is a cost attached to it, um, even if you were to think about like services you used today or something you bought online, the company that sold you that at the end of the day has had to do a whole bunch of things to gradually push you towards you know wherever it is they deliver the, the product to you. Metrics, so really this, this will, all of these cells will change over time, metrics especially early on is just something tangible, measurable that gives you a sense you're on the right track with your business. Um, Good metrics do not include the number of Facebook likes you have. That just is a um, representation of how caring your friends are. Um, good metrics early on won't necessarily be about dollars either. Absolutely further down the track, it'll be evolved to, to being more about profitability and revenue and growth and that sort of stuff. But early on, it's really, for most of us, you know, is there some way we can quantify how engaged a customer is with our product, it's hard enough to get them interested in the first place and to sign up. Once they've signed up, how can we measure, you know, the extent to which they're actually actively using our products? Because if they're actively using it today, the odds are they're more likely to be active, actively using it again tomorrow. So that's the behaviour you really want to track. And the last of those nine cells is called unfair advantage. Um, this is one that I don't think you necessarily have to have. Um, at the beginning, as your business evolves, you might be able to acquire an unfair advantage. Um, examples of unfair advantages 
include if you've got like some really so if you've got some unique skill or person in your network or something special about you that you know the person who might be trying to set up the same business across the road you know they just don't have that same unfair advantage as you and therefore you're more likely to succeed um, an example of how you might get an unfair advantage further down your business is once you you know built up a little bit you might want to get a board and then maybe there's some you know there's the lady on your board who has really great connections into the university or whatever it might be who can really help you grow the business in that case they might become an unfair advantage but you don't need to sort of lose sleep over it at this stage um, the exercise we'll do to hopefully get you guys just putting this into practice is a filling out your own lean canva I think we'll try to do the yeah, maybe if we divvy them up. Um, try to yeah, let's go. Uh, one each or two's worst case scenario. Yes, that's not bad. see how this thing might start coming together and get the creative juices flowing. Uh, we don't have to, but if anyone had a business that they've now come up with, you know, those two words that they think is kind of crazy and interesting and they want to quickly share it, they can. Otherwise, we're going to go through this around some more realistic businesses. You do have one you want to share? Cool. Let's run through it in secret. So what were your words you're playing with uh, then? We, we had plants, Spotify and sex. Um, sax or sex? Sex. Okay. <coughs> Very much sax. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, our, our idea for a business. Nah, we're not actually a weird idea. What's the problem we're solving? Uh, the problem that we're solving is that people um, uh, in WA tend to keep their uh, windows and doors closed because that is ridiculously hot, horribly cold. So, uh, in order to, uh, the problem with that is, um, is that if you have stagnant air, you lose oxygen because you're not getting air circulation, and so people actually tend to get lethargic. Uh, our solution, okay, customer, is, customer. So the customer is basically anyone who works in a space. So okay. uh, I'm not exactly sure what else to say. Uh, we're predominantly aiming at young adults and adults. Yeah. Um, okay. yeah that, that's and what's right. so unique and value about your business? What's that unique value proposition? Um, most air fresheners that people will use. So because we're using plants, most air fresheners that people will use, uh, you want to hide them away, so they try to make them you know, look like whatever color your wall is or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to provide an air freshener that you actually want to look at, which are plants, basically. Okay, solution? Um, uh, the solution is basically um, a, a monthly package mm -hmm. uh, that uh, contains a plant or accessories around that plant. Yeah, I'm not seeing the sex yet. This is. Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> you see the channels or the revenue model? <laughs> <laughs> Probably part of the unique value proposition really is that uh, it makes your bedroom smell nice. For yeah. One thing. So, and we have more oxygen in the bedroom, so more. <laughs> <laughs> now I get it. Gotcha. So that, that's where our sex comes in. Yeah. Uh, channels. Um, social media, newspapers, things like that. It depends who we're targeting. So mm -hmm. for young adults, you'd be probably wanting to do more on the social media yep. side of things. For uh, older adults, perhaps the newspapers, uh, magazines, things like that. Uh, unit revenue, a monthly subscri subscription fee, mm -hmm. um, and they get different things each month. Unit costs would be, uh, yeah, because it's a physical product, you do need to get it and distribute it and get it to all the different people as well as manage all of those accounts. Yep. Um, metrics. Incidents uh, of sex increasing in bedrooms yes, and track that exactly. and feels like therefore uh, they're for the Feedback form on the yeah. amount of sex you had and how good that sex is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, this and is unfair advantage, another chance. Unfair advantage. Uh, not quite sure. I, I'm an engineer, so perhaps uh, we can we can put other things into the pots and whatnot to make them smell even better and make sexy time even better. Good to know. Excellent. 
I knew I missed out when I did engineering. I did the engineering and I did boring law instead. So, um, all right. Quick little observations on again how this link canvas comes together. Then we're going to go back and do a potentially more serious link canvas. Um, again, for those of us who've got businesses or ideas already working on, what I might ask you to do is just jump on one table each, and then people can gravitate to. You know, if we have to average out, there's two of you on one table. We'll jump you over here, and just so we can all work on a specific idea, and then we're going to look back and pitch it. If I could just give some quick other feedback and follow-ups on each of these cells again. So yeah, problem, it might be that we're solving one, two, or three problems. They could be all related, but again, it's all about solving a problem. Um, the tip I would give you about customers is absolutely, like, it's going to be pretty broad, and it could be kind of anyone over time. In a startup, what I would encourage you to think about, though, is like, who's your very first customer? Go for a really niche segment. Um, and the reason we do that is the the more focused that segment is, the better we get to know them, the more we learn from them about the problem that they've got and you know, how we might solve it in a unique and compelling way. Um, and the other good thing about going nice and niche is it's easy to identify channels that could reach directly those people. Um, if I was to give you an example, so when I did my business out of uni, I built a social network for young professionals before, or like at sort of the time Facebook and stuff were coming um, up and so on. Um, my thought process was like, hey, I'm a young professional, I've gone through six years of uni and 12 years of school before that, and I'm in this workforce and I've got money saved to come in, I've got all these different needs. Um, I know heaps of other young professionals like me, all my peers are the same. Uh, there's one and a half million of us, you know, broadly, people who are tertiary educated across Australia in that sort of 25 to 35 age bracket, one and a half million of us, I thought that was my target customer. Um, and then eventually, um, people I was working with said, they sort of bashed me down once a day and said, if you'd started this business again, we think you would have had a greater chance of success if your original customer was that a thousand degrees more focused. And the way they bashed me down was from young professionals in Australia, which was what I thought was my original starting point, and then I'd take over the world. So we went more focused through it, young professionals in WA, young professionals in Perth, young professionals at UWA, so we're getting more and more and more focused. Um, and then where they ended up settling was final year students in the law faculty. So we went from one and a half million sort of potential audience when I started to about 150 people. Now for the entrepreneur, like especially me who's been two years in the business like working my butt off, that's really counterintuitive. Because you're going, why the hell would I only want to sell something to 150 people? But the reality is if I could have got to know that 150 potential customers so damn well, and I would have been able to because I knew exactly where they gathered and at what times of day. They were all in law courtyard at you know, certain times after lectures. So I could have got to know that customer segment really, really well, found out what was the biggest problem for them at that time. It may have been, like a hypothesis, but it may have been, how do I get that first job after I graduate? You know, It may have been something more about money, how do I manage my you know, paycheck when I finally am out of uni and stuff. But if I could have just solved one really, like the most valuable problem for that segment of people, the probability is that if I got to solve that for them and, and got to know them really well, the people in the next faculty next door, accounting or whatever, probably have the same problem as final year students. So I could have started scaling the customer segment sort of, you know, with, with some depth rather than trying to be everything to everyone. Um, and yeah, I went down the everything to everyone path. I wanted to be the one-stop shop. I thought not in these terms, but I think I probably would have had one-stop shop as my unique value proposition. But the reality is that's really hard to do because we've all got really short attention spans. You go and see a new website, and if it doesn't hook you straight away, then you're probably just going to kind of leave that and go somewhere else. And I think that's probably that was my downfall. So again, yeah, when we go through this next exercise, I'll encourage you to just be super focused on your customer segment. Um, you know, proposition. I think we all get that hopefully in our solution. Again, it's just one or two or three key features. So it's a web service, or it's an app, or it's a whatever. And here are the three features that it absolutely must have from day one. Um, all the rest of it, I think, hopefully speaks for itself. Um, again, can we get the show of hands from people who have got an idea they're currently working on and will be keen to use the Lean Thre um, Canvas framework in a group exercise? There's a few hands before, and now we're not putting them up. <laughs> Still got your idea. Good. Who else has got ideas they want to work on? Come on. Yeah? Sweet. Okay. Well, let's sort of just self-organise. Um, there's two of you on that table, so maybe if one of you jumps to this table, and if you're already on a table with someone who's got an idea, let's work as that group of four or so people. Uh, what we want to do is come up with a new land canvas for their business. 
um, and then we're going to pitch the, pitch the um, business back to each other at the end of it all. <laughs> 20 minutes later. A few moments later. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's it for me. Again, like this is supposed to just be a super um, high level intro to Lean Canvas. Key takeouts, hopefully, you guys are left with is that the business is just a collection of stuff, just a collection of assumptions. And our job is to sort of gradually validate those assumptions are more likely to be true than not as we do risk our business. Um, and it's you know, really more important to just kind of get started on it. And it's really powerful when you can just have one piece of paper. Um, you know, a pen, potentially some post it notes, and you start gathering like the building blocks of a business, which are at the end of the day all coming down to not an idea, but all coming down to solving a problem for a customer who's willing to pay you money for a solution that's kind of unique and compelling and, and different to everyone else. And then as the business evolves, can you take that product to them in a way that scales, like can you leverage your you know, distribution channels to um, yeah, make more money and solve more problems? Does anyone have any questions or? Drop someone to throw all over us. Thank you.